Good morning, everybody. I'm Muriel Bowser. I'm the mayor of Washington, D.C. I'm joined today by uh, members of my cabinet. I uh, am joined by the chancellor of D.C. Public Schools as well, who will uh, lead the majority of our conversation today. Uh, we are located at Wheatley Education Campus in Ward 5, and I want to thank Dr. Plenty and the entire Wheatley team um, for hosting us today. Uh, we're also joined by Phil Mendelson, the chairman of the D.C. Council, and as we have done throughout the pandemic, um, the chairman is joining us for his um, press briefing uh, that he conducts prior to the council meeting. I'm going to turn it over to Chairman Mendelson for his presentation uh, and taking questions, uh, and then we will return uh, to updates on term two from DCPS, followed by um, general uh, and specific COVID related questions. Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bowser. And good Good morning to everyone. Uh, as the mayor said, uh, I have, uh, since actually before, before I became chairman with my predecessor, we have a press conference before our legislative meetings, and tomorrow, October 6th, we'll have a legislative meeting. So it's easier, I think, on everybody if we combine the press conference. I don't think that uh, my portion of this will be very long, and I'm happy to take questions before turning it to the mayor. We will begin tomorrow at noon, and we will uh, begin with a meeting of the Committee of the Whole. This will be what we call an additional meeting where there will be four bills marked up by the Committee of the Whole. What will not be marked up, but was noticed last week, a bill concerning dyslexia. We are still working on that. Uh, that uh, addresses uh, how we can improve teaching for uh, students who have reading disabilities. Also, what we had announced last week, but we will not be moving tomorrow, is what's called the REACH Act, uh, re uh, Racial Equity Achieves Results. Uh, the bill is funded and uh, provides that both the legislative and executive branches will have racial equity offices. Uh, I believe that arguably what we uh, move will be uh, the best in the country. We're still working on some details, and so it won't be on tomorrow's agenda, but I expect it will be in two weeks. Uh, there will be several bills from other committees that will be um, processed through the committee as a whole, and then we will start our legislative meeting. Uh, because we met two weeks ago, and we will probably be meeting every two weeks through the fall because this is the end of the council period, uh, I can't say that there's a lot of business. There's not as much as there was on the September 22nd agenda. Phil, I think we want to get you a new mic. This mean I get to start over? Seriously, do I need to start over? Okay. <clears throat> well, we will. Um, the, uh, the the council is meeting tomorrow, October sixth, and uh, we will begin at noon, uh, beginning with the committee of the whole meeting. Uh, there are a number of bills that are in the committee of the whole that are for markup. Uh, what will not be on the agenda for markup tomorrow but was announced last week is a bill concerning dyslexia or reading disorders and another bill called Racial Equity Achieves Results, uh, which uh, is funded, will provide for racial equity offices in both the legislative and executive branches, and I would argue uh, will be uh, one of the best, if not the best, approaches toward racial equity. Uh, on the part of government uh, anywhere in the country, but there's still some details that are being worked out, so that will not be marked up tomorrow. There are several other bills that are being processed through committees that are coming to the committee as a whole, uh, and the, um, so that's rather uh, ministerial, if you will. When the committee of the whole is done meeting, which is probably by 1 o'clock, uh, we will begin our regular monthly legislative meeting. Uh, there will not be as much business on the agenda as there was two weeks ago uh, because we are now uh, meeting every two weeks through the fall since it's the end of the council period. Uh, probably the most newsworthy of bills that will be marked up is a, um, it's actually a resolution uh, that's coming out of the Committee of the Whole that uh, supports the renaming of Wilson High School. It does not select a name, but it urges that the process begin immediately with the D.C. public school system to uh, look for 
a new name for Wilson High School. Uh, the issue there, as I'm assuming many people know, is that um, uh, President Woodrow Wilson, while he had um, many domestic and international accomplishments, also um, reversed the course of the federal government with regard to hiring and uh, Jim Crow and uh, uh, segregated the federal workforce and uh, that had a, a specific effect on the District of Columbia and uh, because of that racist legacy, uh, the assuming that the council approves this tomorrow, which I do assume, uh, the council will be saying that it's time to change the name. Uh, there are um, other what we call emergency bills, which are temporary bills that are coming before the council tomorrow to deal with, uh, actually three deal with uh, tenant, landlord tenant issues. One of them has to do with um, the, um, uh, what do I want to say, the, uh, the process uh, surrounding evictions, uh, requiring that uh, eviction records be, be uh, sealed after three years, that uh, a landlord cannot ask an eviction history of a prospective tenant, uh, an eviction history older than three years, uh, urging that the Superior Court increase the filing fees for evictions, prohibiting evictions in amounts under $600, and also addressing uh, that uh, landlords have to look at more than just simply, simply and solely the credit score when they are evaluating uh, a prospective tenant. All this is meant at getting at some of the uh, barriers that make it very difficult, particularly for low-income folks, to rent in the district. Uh, once an individual is evicted, that uh, carries on their record and makes it more difficult for them to rent again, even if they have pulled themselves out of economic distress. And this bill attempts to address that. Another bill concerns emergency rental assistance program, uh, trying to broaden somewhat the uh, criteria for access to emergency rental assistance, uh, tying it to 40% area median income, for example, giving the Department of Human Services uh, discretion to waive um, uh, the ceiling on how much money can be given out uh, to individuals or households through the Emergency Rental Assistance or ERAP program. Uh, some of the other emergency bills that are coming up tomorrow, a uh, revised game of skill machines, consumer protection emergency, uh, which uh, is, I'm going to say, fairly technical in terms of making some clarifying changes in the law uh, regulating Games of Skill, which is relatively new in the district and elsewhere. An emergency dealing with what we call streeteries, which are the restaurants that have uh, moved out into the streets, usually the parking lane, uh, given the restrictions of the public health emergency. And this uh, emergency not only continues a program in place, but um, gives authority for it to continue uh, into the spring. Uh, those are probably the highlights of tomorrow's meeting. If there are questions for anybody, I'm happy to answer them at this point regarding the council meeting. The next council meeting after tomorrow will be on October 20th. Are there any questions? Yes. I do have one question about the Wilson High School resolution. It, it, that's a resolution. There's nothing, is there anything binding about that? As a matter of law, there's nothing binding. However, I think the council expressing this opinion, which I expect it will do unanimously, um, is an important step in making sure that the government, and in particular DCPS, moves forward with this. And then if I could just follow up, given the mayor has already said previously that she wants Wilson changed, and her FACES group has listed Wilson on their list, so I'm wondering why you I mean, I know there's been a lot of attention on Wilson, but I'm just wondering why the council chose to carve Wilson out rather than look at the entire FACES report uh, that the mayor's task force submitted that has numerous recommendations that go way beyond Wilson High School. Uh, actually, that's a good question because it highlights that I did not fully describe the resolution that we will be uh, marking up tomorrow. It does speak to the need for a broader process of looking at names. So it's not isolated to Wilson. Um, it is too soon for the council to have acted on the mayor's uh, faces report. Uh, that's why it doesn't go as far as addressing faces or implementing faces. Um, <clears throat> but it does urge that the DCPS revise its protocol, which right now, if I remember correctly, 
provides that when a group comes forward with a name for a school, that then the um, DCPS has this process for looking at renaming a school. And what we are urging is that um, there, that, that protocol needs to change so that schools can be identified and the process can begin without a name. I think I said this earlier, the council is not suggesting a name. We had a hearing, there were some suggestions made. I think there has to be a public process. An important part of the name of a school building or any public space is that there has to be community support. And let's see what the community thinks, but we, we want this to happen quickly. Last on this, did the council do a fiscal impact on Wilson alone or on any of this? Uh, we did ask for a cost. Uh, it didn't go through the rigor of a chief financial officer uh, analysis because this is a resolution and therefore it does not technically have a fiscal impact, but the estimate we got is that if all the signs and insignia and everything that has Wilson on it is changed at Woodrow Wilson and changed at once, that it could cost as much as $1.2 million. Yes, Mr. Rice. The question was why the dyslexia bill has been um, delayed, because we were looking to mark it up on tomorrow. Um, we are still working through some details. The bill that came the bill was sequentially referred, and as it came out of the Education Committee, it had a cost of over $10 million a year. And it's unlikely that, particularly given our declining revenues at the moment, that uh, we would find the $10 million for that. So we are looking at uh, how to restructure the bill to get down the cost. Uh, we talked about uh, various measures for records. What, how does this feed into the whole uh, reclaim rent control proposals, including canceling rent, which is one of their main uh, the question is, how do the bills concerning landlord-tenant tomorrow feed into the broader debate around rent control and, in particular, uh, to cancel rent? Uh, they don't address that at all. Um, and I don't think there is support in the council for canceling rent. Um, uh, everybody's hurting here, both uh, tenants as well as property owners in this recession. Um, now, this bill looks at some specific issues around evictions as well as rental assistance. And uh, so, for example, uh, in the debate that you allude to with regard to rent control, uh, I think there's been very little discussion about the court process. I didn't mention this earlier, but if I remember correctly, on average, there are about 31,000 eviction cases filed in landlord-tenant court every year. And 12% uh, of those cases are for amounts under $600 which is why we have a provision that says that uh, a landlord can't go to landlord-tenant court for amounts under $600, to evict for amounts under $600. There are other options for collecting. This is all to get at the eviction process and to reduce the incidence of eviction cases which stick with tenants even if they weren't evicted and makes it hard for them to rent in the future. Uh, similarly, uh, we found that uh, the district is an outlier with regard to the court filing fee. Uh, we have the lowest, I believe the lowest in the country uh, for filing and therefore it's very easy for a landlord to file a uh, case. The 31,000 cases, if I remember correctly, end up resulting in under 2,000 actual evictions. So there's a huge number of cases, in fact there are quite a number, a significant number, that are simply repeat uh, filings by landlords. and. Um, Cases settle uh, or whatever the particulars are, but they don't result in an eviction, but they do hurt a tenant and hurt a tenant for arguably for life in terms of trying to find other um, new housing accommodations. So you can see that those are issues that aren't squarely within the debate about rent control itself. Yes. Your colleague, Council Member McDuffie, um said that he wanted to start a task force, proposed a task force for re reparations for African-American residents. Do you have a stance on that? Uh, I have not looked at that. I'm not familiar with that. I do know that there are two other bills that Mr. McDuffie has introduced that we are working on, I'm hoping, in a couple of weeks 
one deals with the monuments more broadly and the other, well, they both deal with monuments. But on that particular issue, no, I don't. Mr. Rice. You mentioned monuments. Do you have a particular position on the Lincoln statue of Lincoln Park? Um, I certainly think that there needs to be interpretive materials there for that statue. I think that uh, I've, I've heard people argue strongly in support of it and people condemn it. And I think when one looks at it, one can see both views. When one looks at that statue, that memorial, they can see both views. And if nothing else, there ought to be uh, more interpretive, interpretive signage there to, to explain the statue. Madam Mayor, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Mr. All. Chairman. Thank you. I'm going to start with some uh, basic information about our metrics, and then we will move into the DCPS discussion. Uh, this morning, we announced 28 new cases of COVID in our community, and fortunately, uh, no uh, no additional Washingtonians uh, succumb to the virus since we last reported. Uh, you can also see our metrics related to the level of community spread, uh, the health system capacity, public health systems capacity, uh, and our level of community engagement. Um, and we are... Um, we, we see progress on many of those metrics. Also this morning, we released the updated list of states that DC Health uh, considers high risk. Uh, New Mexico was added and Arizona was removed. Uh, and as a reminder, if you travel uh, to and from these states for non-essential business, you will need to quarantine for 14 days uh, when you get back to D.C. Uh, as of this morning, uh, as well, more than 400,000 people have been tested for COVID-19 uh, in D.C., including uh, almost 120,000 tests completed at our public testing sites. And as a reminder, those sites are free, and there we test individuals who are three years of age and older. Uh, you can go to coronavirus.dc.gov for our daily testing locations. Starting today, we are making slight adjustments to the hours um, to accommodate the change in light available. <laughs> Um, the F Street, Anacostia, and UDC at Birdie Backus sites are now operating from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m., Monday through Friday. And our firehouse testing sites are now open from 3 p.m. to 7 p.m., Monday through Friday. And the Saturday hours at the firehouses remain noon to 4 p.m. So once again, coronavirus.dc.gov for um, up-to-date listings on where you might get tested. Um, this Monday, just go back one second, um, for example, our main drive through sites are at Judiciary Square at F Street between 4th and 5th Streets and in Anacostia. Um, also, a uh, walk-up uh, site at 2241 Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue, just a block away um, from the big chair. Additionally, today you can go to Turkey Thicket Recreation Center from 10 a.m. Uh, to 4 p.m. And our evening hours start at 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. at four uh, D.C. firehouses. Today we are also proud uh, to announce that we have a second partner uh, in helping to distribute the flu vaccine that will allow us to provide flu shots at six of our firehouse testing sites, um, and that's CVS. So we want to thank CVS for joining uh, with us to make sure um, that everybody is getting the flu vaccine. Anybody, everybody six months and older uh, should get their flu vaccine. And I'm told by Dr. Nesbitt that this is the right time to do it. Um, so please go to your doctor's office. Uh, you may also go to one of these testing sites 
you need to bring your insurance card and ID um, for testing at these sites. Uh, and there are also free sites available, and you can uh, get that information um, by going to the D.C. Health website um, for uh, information there. Now uh, we want to provide you with an update on uh, Term 2 at D.C. Public Schools, which starts and on November the 9th. Uh, and as you can see from the data we release each and every day, the district will continue to take how we contain this virus. Yes. So um, we uh, know that there is a real urgency in starting to get young people back to our schools safely uh, and with the necessary protocols in place to protect students, to protect our staff uh, and our families. So our entire DCPS community, along with the rest of DC government, is doing everything that we can to make distance learning work. Uh, and I want to thank the, the teachers and the staff uh, who turned on a dime um, to switch to virtual learning. Um, we know that they are exercising every skill that they have um, to be engaging uh, and to make sure that this experience is good for our children and families. So we thank them for all that they are doing. Um, but we also know uh, that this uh, distance learning is not working for a lot of our kids, uh, and it doesn't allow us to reach our young people in the same way. Uh, so I want to turn to Chancellor Faraby uh, to talk about uh, what DCPS has been doing to get ready. Good morning. Thank you, Mayor Bowser. Also want to acknowledge the leadership of Principal Plenty here at Wheatley Education Campus today. Thank you for hosting us. It's important for us to ground in some of our numbers for uh, term one, which we're currently in now until uh, November 6th, and we'll begin term two on November 9th. Uh, one of the data points I'm really proud of, and as Mayor Bowser highlighted, our teachers, our school-based staff, and central service team have done a remarkable job in helping our students and families be more engaged uh, during this pandemic. And so we're proud that over 92% of our students are regularly logging in online uh, to meet with teachers, participate in live learning, and also to access our learning materials. Uh, we continue to provide meals to our students and families, and DCPS provided over 1.2 million free meals uh, served since March and 33,000 in term one. Uh, we continue to see lots of interest from families in our parent university series, which has helped families navigate the new school year. We've seen over about 12,000 families uh, already log in and access our materials. Uh, we are committed to ensuring that every student who needs a device has a device for learning at home. To date, we've provided over 29,900 uh, devices to students, including uh, the iPad device, which is distributed to our pre-K-3, pre-K-4 families. And then we've also served over 13,000 callers in our help desk that's supporting families troubleshoot uh, some of our technology challenges. And then our teachers, again, they've done an extraordinary job and they launch our Canvas classrooms. We want to talk a little bit more about Canvas today, but we have 11,000 Canvas courses companions. Uh, this is where students go to access their content for their grade level. Uh, this is where they also access all of their assignments and curriculum materials. So given where we are in term one, uh, the question is now what happens in the future for term two and term three? Uh, DCPS is excited uh, to plan for these terms with our learners' needs in mind and excited to welcome back our elementary students uh, in term two in grades pre-K through five in our buildings. And we're going to talk a little bit more today about what those options are for our students in pre-K through five. Uh, currently, as we're currently in term one, it's important to note that we have launched 
our student support centers. We have two uh, that have already started implementation of services and we'll have more uh, throughout term one. And then in term three, we will welcome back our secondary students in grades six through 12. Uh, as we uh, move throughout the discussion this morning, it's important also to note when we speak of elementary grades, pre-K through five, this also considers our education campuses that serve pre-K through eighth grade. Families will always have the option uh, to continue learning at home throughout term one, term two, and term three. Going forward, the question about why returning to in-person learning is one that we want to start with responding. Uh, we know, as we've mentioned earlier, that learning at home has been positive for many of our students because of the extraordinary work of our teachers. And they continue to exercise creativity, uh, create enriching activities for our students, uh, sparking curiosity and also encouraging our students. However, we also know at this time that learning at home is not working for every student. And we particularly know that our youngest learners have been the most challenged. And so as we think about term two and learning in person, we have prioritized our youngest learners by providing a safe and supportive learning environment for them. Uh, we also know that we have uh, known subgroups of students uh, that have had opportunity gaps uh, prior to COVID-19. And so we're also offering in-person instruction uh, to those groups of students where we know that there are known opportunity gaps uh, to mitigate further learning loss. And then finally, we continue to maximize learning time. Whether students are learning at home or learning at school, we want to continue to ensure that they're getting the best uh, experience possible. Our secondary courses are also built on a semester schedule, uh, and that is one of the drivers for our decision around uh, term two for our secondary students. Uh, so many of our students in grades six through 12 are assigned to a teacher by their course uh, rather than grade level compared to elementary schools, and they have courses and classes that are assigned on a semester basis. So for term one, term two, for example, uh, you may have a different set of courses that you take compared to term three and term four. Uh, we believe that a transition in term two would be more disruptive for our middle school and high school students. DCPS has done tremendous work to prepare for operating in person. Uh, there's a number of steps that we've taken in our efforts for planning and also we outline today uh, the work that we will do as we move towards November 9th and then the monitoring that will take place thereafter. Uh, we have issued a uh, COVID-19 operational handbook and templates to help guide and support principals. We've also provided uh, sessions and office hours for principals to, to best understand how operations will flow. And then we've also provided information on what model entry uh, will look like and how to set up their buildings. And then we'll continue to support them with review of their plans of their building. And today I'm going to highlight some of that. You can see uh, today on the campus at Wheatley Education Campus, as you walked in, you saw uh, some of our sanitizing stations. Uh, you can see throughout the building our social distancing signage. All of that is a part of the review plan for our schools. We will also continue to uh, prep and support uh, schools uh, on an individual basis to ensure that all of the social distancing guidelines are adhered to appropriately. Uh, we've already distributed uh, PPE to schools. Uh, we have uh, adult and uh, children's size masks as well that we'll continue to provide uh, to schools. And then we're also providing supports to schools to address uh, essential work orders or the HVAC enhancements that we've referenced previously, uh, and we are prioritizing our elementary buildings for the HVAC enhancements. 
We will continue to review the safety plans for schools uh, between now and uh, November 9th, and DCPS principals will also be hosting building walks with uh, local school advisory teams, uh, PTA, and union representatives to ensure that others that are associated with our school campuses have the ability to come and uh, review the work and also to do a walkthrough of our buildings. Uh, and once we launch our in-person learning experiences, we'll continue uh, to monitor uh, the protocols and ensure that all of the PPE and resources are appropriately uh, distributed to school along with all of our work orders and HVAC enhancements. For term two for pre-K through five and then also our education campuses, there are three options for students. As I mentioned earlier, learning at home will continue to be an option for families. In this model, students will have the opportunity to have live virtual instruction, and they will also have independent learning time. Uh, students will continue to master topics that are most crucial to their success, and they will also continue to run in our program of five days a week. We are offering in-person learning in uh, in-person learning classrooms. In this model, uh, students will learn in small cohorts, uh, and they will be assigned to a cohort based on their grade level. Uh, and there will be a daily schedule that is very similar uh, to the traditional school day. Uh, however, there will be one classroom at each grade level, and that will be at every elementary school. We're also prioritizing self-contained uh, special education classrooms uh, for services as well. And this will begin on November 9th. And the programming for our in-person learning will run uh, four full days, and it will be a half day on Wednesday. We're also pleased to offer student care classrooms. And student care classrooms are Canvas Academic and Real Engagement Classrooms. Again, that's Canvas Academics and Real Engagement Classrooms in this model. Uh, students learn in small cohorts as well. However, they will be assigned to an adult that will supervise uh, the cohort that is not their teacher. Uh, the adult will provide support to students in their virtual learning. Uh, students will have the opportunity to socialize with their peers. They'll have breaks throughout the day. They'll have access to recess and also access to meals as well. Uh, we will have a staggered implementation of this model. Uh, it will begin with pre-K grades, uh, pre-K 3, pre-K 4 to grade 1, uh, beginning the week of November 16th. And for grades 2 through 5, this will begin the week of November 30th. Similar to our in-person learning classroom, this will be a uh, five-day week model with four full days and a half day on Wednesdays. More information about our Canvas Academics and Real Engagement Classrooms. Uh, this is a outline of the learning model. As I mentioned earlier, students will continue their virtual learning uh, and the supervised by an adult. Uh, they will also be provided meals, including breakfast and lunch. We also outline the staff role of the adult that will be supervising uh, the Canvas Academic Real Engagement Classroom. Uh, the individual will be responsible for maintaining a safe environment, a positive learning environment. They will also support students with accessing their learning materials online. Uh, they will also facilitate arrival, dismissal, uh, and any transitions throughout the day, and will be communicating with families as well. Uh, we also outline uh, the staffing model, so we'll continue to utilize uh, DCPS staff, uh, and we have a large contingency of other uh, government employees that meet the qualifications that are outlined on the slide, which includes a background check and educational credentials as well. We estimate that we can serve approximately 21,000 students between the in-person learning classroom and the Canvas Academic Real Engagement classrooms. Uh, we believe that this represents approximately 75% of our pre-K through five uh, students enrolled. Uh, 
Uh, however, we cannot guarantee a seat for all students between the in-person learning classroom and the uh, Canvas academic and real engagement classroom. Um, but we will continue to uh, provide families more information about how they can enroll. Uh, we believe that this is a good estimate of where we were in parent interest in the summer. Uh, in the summer, approximately 20, 25 percent of our families reported they have a preference for virtual learning. So we anticipate uh, 25 percent of our population uh, will continue to want in-person learning. And again, 75 percent of our students could potentially be served through our in-person learning and uh, Canvas academics and real engagement classrooms. Uh, this number of 21,000 seats is based on the number of classroom spaces that can be utilized in our buildings, which is approximately uh, 2,300 spaces within our buildings. We are also estimating 5 to 11 students per classroom. That number is lower for our pre-K-3 and pre-K-4 classes and also our special education self-contained classrooms which totals the 21,000 seats. Uh, we estimate that we can offer approximately 7,000 in-person learning classroom seats, uh, and we can offer 14,000 um, engagement, engagement classrooms for our Canvas engagement and real engagement classrooms. And important to note as we think about uh, our in-person learning, that these are organized by grade level. And so it is one classroom per grade level at every school, uh, pre-K through five, also including our education campuses that serve grades pre-K through eight. For our selection process, we are prioritizing classroom for our elementary students with the highest need uh, based on the current enrollment information that we have. And so there will be a random selection process in which we will prioritize first students that are experiencing homelessness, uh, students that are receiving special education services, and then also students who are English language learners. Uh, we will also prioritize students who are designated as at risk and then all other students enroll. We will also be able to provide a sibling preference uh, for those students who have siblings and they may be in a in-person learning classroom or uh, we will prioritize siblings for our Canvas academics and real engagement classrooms as well. Um, the self-contained special education classrooms uh, will follow a, a similar prioritization uh, with one, students experiencing homelessness, and then secondly, all other students uh, that are in self-contained special education classrooms. It's also important to note that our school administrators uh, have the ability to uh, appeal uh, to the central office team to make uh, any special seat assignments uh, in our in-person learning classroom, and any special assignment would need to be approved, again, by the central office team. And so families may be wondering, so what do I do next? Uh, families should expect to hear from us in the coming weeks, and we will reach out if a student is selected uh, in the randomized lottery process that I've described. Uh, the school will reach out directly and offer seats to families. And on this graphic, we outline the process of the seat offering um, designations. And so once a seat is offered, uh, a family can accept the classroom seat. If the family accepts the classroom seat, whether that be in-person learning or our Canvas academics and, and real engagement classroom, uh, then they will be provided a designated start date. If a family is offered a seat and they decline the offering, uh, they will continue with learning at home and that particular seat will be offered to another student. Uh, we today also lift up our planning and monitoring tools. Um, we provided schools information, as I referenced previously, about their operations. Uh, operations handbook guide has been provided to schools. We will also continue to lift up our readiness checklist. 
uh, which provides a set of expectations and standards for every facility that they must meet. Uh, and those expectations are aligned to DC Health, IC, and CDC guidelines to mitigate the spread of COVID-19. Um, here you can see our health and safety commitments. Uh, these are commitments that DCPS have uh, previously uh, communicated to families, and we will continue uh, to implement uh, in-person learning uh, and our real engagement in Canvas Academics classrooms accordingly. Uh, here we highlight a day in a life. Uh, it's important to note that we thought through every aspect of the day for our students. Uh, and we will schedule accordingly uh, for arrival. For example, there are designated spaces for health screening and verification uh, of a temperature check. Uh, we also are providing spaces for students to uh, san use sanitizers for hands and also receive a face covering for today. Uh, it's also important to note that there will be staggered times for breakfast. Uh, there will be minimal uh, transitions. There will be staggered time for lunch and staggered time for recess, uh, and there will be designated spaces for restroom use uh, through the building so students know exactly where they can go, uh, and then dismissal will also be on a staggered time as well. We also want to remind families as they accept seats that immunization requirements are still in effect. Uh, beginning the 2021 school year, immunizations are required for in-person attendance. And so we are asking families to ensure that they complete the right vaccinations for the student's age group. Uh, and we also want to note the families that once they receive an offer, they must provide immunization certification for their student uh, to participate in in-person experiences. What do we do and how do we respond to COVID-19? Uh, as we track toward in-person experiences, uh, if a student, staff member, or community member uh, have been in our buildings and test positive with COVID-19, uh, DCPS will take a number of steps to ensure that uh, safety is maintained and communication and transparency is maintained. Uh, to minimize the impact and the spread of COVID-19 in any building, as I mentioned earlier, students are cohorted. When students are cohorted, they are with their cohort in their classroom throughout the day, and they transition with that group of students throughout the day. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, those are smaller number of students, anywhere between 5 to 11 students, to ensure that there is a healthy social distancing. We're also providing uh, extensive training for all of our school leaders and staff on our reporting and response protocols. And when there is a confirmed positive case of an individual in the school building, uh, individuals will be notified uh, that are close contacts, and also there will be uh, school-wide communication, and then we'll provide any guidance to any individual needing to quarantine accordingly in alignment with D.C. Health uh, and CDC guidelines. Uh, we've talked a lot about close contacts. I just want to remind everyone uh, the definition of a close contact. Uh, that is anyone who is within six feet or two meters of an individual with a uh, COVID-19 case for a prolonged period of time uh, and having a direct contact with an infection secretion from an individual with COVID-19. Uh, once, again, those individuals are identified, we will follow uh, the protocols for communication and self-quarantine. We wanted to provide a couple examples of what that would look like. And so here we provide an example of a school and you can see the various cohorts for each classroom, whether that be an in-person learning classroom or a Canvas academics and real engagement classroom. You can see in this example, we highlight in a fourth grade cohort in a classroom, what happens if a teacher uh, tests positive. And so if a teacher were to test positive, students and staff in that fourth grade classroom in that cohort uh, will be required to quarantine for 14 days. Uh, the school will follow all steps with DC Health and CDC for cleaning, disinfecting, and sanitation. And then there will be notification to the entire school community and the DC Contact Tracing Force will interview the teacher. 
in the next example, we provide uh, a snapshot again into the cohorts within the building, but this time uh, we show an example of what happens if a student were to test positive. Again, students and staff within that second grade classroom, within that cohort, will be required to set quarantine for 14 days, and then we'll follow our cleaning protocols and sanitation and disinfection, and then we'll also provide the entire school community with information about the positive case along with uh, the contact tracing interviews. And then in this example, we provide more information on what we're what would happen if a parent or a member of a household of a student test positive? Uh, the student would be required to quarantine for 14 days, and then the D.C. Health Contact Trace Force will also interview the parent uh, and follow their protocols accordingly. Um, and the final example uh, we provided, what if a staff member is in a building uh, but they're not associated with a cohort of students, what would happen if that staff member tests positive? Uh, if that were to occur, staff and students in close contact with that staff member would be notified and be required to quarantine for uh, 14 days, and then we will follow our cleaning protocols, and then we will also notify the entire school community of the positive case, and then the contact tracing interview would take place with the staff member. DCPS is committed to uh, transparency uh, as we think about in-person experiences in our building, uh, and we'll be providing regular reporting on COVID-19 cases. Uh, DC personnel working in the building, uh, we will provide total number on personnel positive cases and then uh, the total number of personnel currently being quarantined due to COVID-19. For students participating in in-learning activities, we will also report the total number of students who have tested positive, and then we will also report the total number of students that are currently quarantined due to COVID-19. We will continue to work with schools on their readiness as we track towards November 9th. Uh, this includes ensuring that all of the PPE is within the building um, to also ensure that all of the supplies are in the building and uh, the school has the daily health screening uh, certification completed and then the enhanced routines are ready and in place. It's also important to note that there will be new guidelines for visitors uh, new visitor management protocols will be in place to ensure that uh, anyone not associated with in-person experiences, uh, that is limited. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there will be extensive training uh, for staff uh, prior to beginning the in-person learning activities. And then we continue to uh, work with our staff on our staff survey uh, to ensure that we consider uh, any needs of staff as we consider who would be assigned to virtual learning and who would be assigned to in-person activity. Uh, and we will we'll assign uh, those roles to staff accordingly. Uh, DCPS has provided to our employee groups our staffing assignment framework, which includes uh, four options that consider uh, various leave provisions that staff uh, have access to uh, and also considers other special uh, situations and conditions for staff. Next steps for us is to complete the staff survey that we have outlined and once we have that information we'll provide uh, assignments back out to staff. Uh, we're asking families to be on the lookout for information for uh, seats. The expectation is that seats uh, will be offered uh, by uh, October 23rd. Uh, and then we also will communicate with families uh, about the expectation and the process for our um, Canvas Academics and Real Engagement Classroom. And we expect that information to be complete by October 30th. Families can also gather more information uh, through two events that DCPS will be hosting. There will be a term two overview on October 6th at 5.30 p.m. Uh, and there will also be a public health panel as well on October 14th 
from 6 to 7 uh, p.m. Families are encouraged to register uh, for those events. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor. Good, good. I think you covered a lot. I'm not sure how you could possibly have any questions after that. Great overview. I appreciate it. Um, and so why don't we start? Well, I'll just open it up for questions. The topic, yes. One point uh, I do want to add is, is as we think about the staff assignments, uh, it's important to note that uh, as a part of this effort, any uh, DCPS staff member who has a child in a DCPS school, uh, we are guaranteeing them a seat in our uh, Canvas academic and real engagement classroom uh, to relieve any child care um, challenges that uh, employees may be experiencing. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor. Okay, questions? Yes, sir. Clarify. The care option, the students are in the building, but on their computers, basically, right? In small groups with, with a teacher sort of monitoring? Is that the, did I get that right? Yeah, I think I heard you correctly in that regardless of, of the in-person experience, every student will be cohorted. Uh, for in-person classrooms, uh, in-person learning classrooms, they will be with a teacher that will mirror the traditional uh, school day, and they will be with that teacher for the full day, and there will be live instruction with that teacher. In the care classroom, uh, they will be supervised by an adult, but they will be working on a computer, uh, virtual learning, as they are doing now at home. So bringing their laptops into the school and sort of working together in small groups online. That is correct. And all of this, there's no hybrid. There's no two-day a week, if I'm understanding this. Everything is five days or, or at home, right? Yeah, so five days learning at home uh, for our in-person activities. It is five days, but the Wednesday is a half day. Right, and to also just summarize um, this uh, in-person opportunity is now available in term two for pre-k through fifth grade and so parents and you saw the what how DCPS will be able to um, offer uh, to up to 21,000 um, seats 21,000 um, in the pre-k through five grade spectrum School day is 8:45. Well, 8:45 to 3:15. Is that the same thing uh, in this system? Yes, we are expecting to maintain uh, the traditional school hours, uh, but as mentioned earlier, uh, families may be asked to stagger uh, around entry and dismissal time, so we don't have uh, a large number of students, um, you know, waiting to enter the building or exiting the building at the same time. Scenarios. Um, so basically, we're talking about kids at home, kids basically at school doing the same stuff as kids at home, and then kids with in person in school. How did you break that down amongst the 21,000? Yeah, so we anticipate, um, again, based on the numbers that we had from our, our summer survey, uh, that at least 20, 25%, possibly more of our families want uh, to continue to learn at home and what's happening right now is working for them. Uh, we have then two other groups uh, that represent the 21,000 that was referenced and approximately 7,000 of that 2,100 would be in-person learning classroom opportunities and then uh, the remaining would be uh, classrooms for care uh, for supervision by an adult. Okay, so I just want to get it straight. So 7,000 will be in, in a small group with a teacher for instruction. That's our capacity, correct. 14,000 will be in an area with a supervisor taking the same kind of online classes. That is correct. That is correct. Again, those are those are estimates, and also reflects our, our building capacity. In the thousands, how does that work? So, so seven thousand, uh, seven thousand in person, fourteen thousand in school, but doing virtual work. And how many would be at home? So, um, the universe for our 
our pre-K through five is approximately 30,000. And so uh, you take the 21,000 that we referenced today. And so uh, based on the numbers that we had over the summer, that could be about 9,000 students uh, for the total uh, pre-K through five population. Perry? Yeah. Um, so will you, is this classroom that students are assigned to, does that correspond with the school that they attend? When you say, for instance, there's a 2,300 classroom capacity, will you be utilizing middle and high schools as well? Yeah, thank you for that question. We will not um, utilize uh, our, our secondary spaces at this time. Uh, we will primarily utilize our elementary spaces. Uh, we shared previously that we're prioritizing our elementary facilities for our HVAC enhancement and our work orders. And right now we're focused on our elementary buildings. Uh, students will only be assigned uh, to their current school for in-person learning classrooms or care classrooms. And it's, it's important to note for the in-person learning classroom, there will be approximately one uh, per grade level at every school. And then there would be uh, self-contained offerings as well uh, based on the needs of the students in that building. And again, it would be those students that are assigned to that particular building. There's one classroom of in-person teaching plus self-contained. Does that mean special education? That is correct. Okay, potentially two classrooms of in-person learning per school with one being self-contained. Typically, our self-contained classrooms serve a wide range of grades, and so it typically you won't see, you know, one grade level. It could be pre-K through one or two through five, um, but you would see a in-person learning classroom, uh, one at pre-K three, one at pre-K four, one at kindergarten, first, second grade, and thereafter. Yes. Uh, how many teachers and staff members do you expect you'll need for this in-person rollout? And um, will teachers who don't want to return have the option to stay uh, with distance learning? So we believe that to maximize our capacity of the 21,000 uh, seats, we would need approximately 3,400 staff members between in-person learning classroom and care classrooms. Uh, we are following the uh, staff assignment framework uh, to make assignments to staff, as I mentioned earlier. Yes, Mark. Uh, so could you first help us just with some dates that parents need to know? Is there something, action that parents need to take, and when do they need to take it if they want to choose or sign up to be considered for one of those three options? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mark. I want to be really clear on this point because I think families will ask what's next. And so we want them to be a part of our virtual information session. So we encourage families uh, to go and register uh, for the session on tomorrow evening and then also on the 14th. Uh, but they don't need to do anything right now beyond that because schools will reach out to families directly to make offers for the in-person learning classroom seats or the care classroom seats and the self-contained special education classroom seats. If it's just so that I have my head wrapped around this. So if I'm a parent, I don't need to do anything. DCPS will tell me, hey, you won the lottery or you were chosen for in-person classroom or you were chosen for the CARES classroom. And then they would have to respond to you and tell you Yay or nay, is that correct? That is correct. Parents would not have an option to choose between one of those two options. They can always choose in-home, correct? Yeah, so there, it's important to know, but there, there's essentially in the lottery process, uh, you may not receive a offer for an in-person learning classroom seat, uh, and we expect that to be complete by October 23rd. But you could still receive a care classroom seat, and that process is uh, scheduled to be completed by October 30th. Okay, so if they don't get in-person or care, and they're going to have, have to continue at home learning, when would they be notified of that? Would they, is there a notification that goes out regardless of which of the three options they get? Once we've completed the 
student assignment process, we will uh, communicate to families when that process is complete. It will be rather fluid because we will reach out to families ultimately who uh, have uh, been selected for a seat and they may want to continue with learning at home. And so then we'll need to continue to offer seats based on the lottery results. But once all of that is complete, we will communicate uh, to families that all of the seats have been assigned. Uh, and it's also important to note that we are expecting uh, once families uh, take a seat, in addition to uh, the immunization reminder, it's also important to note that we expect them to maintain that seat throughout uh, term two. And then can you tell us the date? Term three would be six through 12, correct? That is correct. Same type of three choice options? Uh, it, it could look a little bit different for six through 12. Um, you know, you, you remember back in the summer, uh, our scheduling was a little bit different for our, our secondary schools. And we'll provide information uh, to families of what uh, the schedule will be for 6 through 12, and uh, Term 3 will start in February. I'm sorry, so that was going to be my next question. When was Term 3? Term 3 starts in February. I believe it's the 1st. First. Okay, and so there would be notification weeks out, similar to what you're doing for elementary. That is correct. The numbers that you broke down for the percentage of students you can accommodate in Term 3 for 6 through 12, do you have those numbers? What's your total universe? What percentage of those students do you think you can accommodate in person? Uh, I'm anticipate it would be really similar to our elementary buildings. Uh, based on the capacity, um, we could house up to about 75% potentially, uh, but that would depend on scheduling um, because uh, the number of students that you have in a cohort, uh, how you utilize your space could dictate uh, the number of students that you can serve, uh, but I anticipate we'll see similar numbers compared to what we're seeing at the elementary level in terms of our capacity. Before we get off that point, um, the thing that I would uh, ask parents to think about even before the 23rd when they hear from us is having their immunizations up to date. Um, they can do that right now. Yes. On, there was talk uh, from parents, especially concerned about their kids keeping their masks on um, in the school facility. Can you talk about what the expectations are for PPE and um, what will be done by the school to reinforce this? Is there any punishment if the students keep taking off their masks? Or not? So what we've seen in, in studying other school districts or other schools that have had in-person experiencing experiences is important to uh, do training with staff on uh, the protocols for, for mask wearing and also any other PPE, uh, and to start early on with reminders to students and also throughout the day ensure that there are, again, reminders for students about their masks. Um, we haven't seen nationally a need to discipline students. However, uh, the expectation will be that once a student arrives on campus, and they receive their face covering for the day, that that face covering is worn throughout the day uh, until dismissal, until a student goes home. And a question on the cohorts. Uh, if someone tests positive, right, you showed the, either a teacher or a student, is there any plan to immediately remove that person from the cohort, cohort or do they all stay put where they are? How do you separate? Yeah, so the, the cohorts will will remain together. Uh, again, if there is a positive case within the cohort, um, the individuals within that cohort will be notified and required to quarantine for the 14 days. And then we will follow our, our cleaning protocols. And then um, we will also notify the entire school community of the positive case. And to follow up, there was, um, there was a concern Obviously, the Teachers Association, um, Teachers Union, Nurse Association have expressed concerns. One from the Nurse Association was about those students who maybe need medications. Has there been a plan outlined for any students if they leave the cohort, go to a nurse's office or anything like that, what the plan is to treat those students who have special needs in that way? Yes, there is plan for isolation, and we will uh, create the structures to ensure that if there's a need to uh, have a, a, a staff person or a student be isolated. 
uh, for for health reasons, that our schools are prepared to do so, and there are clear protocols for that. What is the plan then if a student needs a medication, say a student with diabetes needs to take insulin or, or something like that? So all of our schools have had health professionals that administer medications in school, and that process will not change. So you technically have then a nurse can go into the different cohorts, can, or can you just explain, or is there any separation of students maybe going to the nurse's office to get the medication? So um, I, I think we're getting into a, an issue that's a non-issue, right? So people go into health care offices and receive care, uh, and so students will be able to access the school health suite, and there's aggressive documentation on a regular basis as to who accessed the school health suite during the day. So that issue, we don't need to have an individual health care provider following every child to school every day because they have a medication need. Sam? Um, that may be possible, uh, given, you know, the scheduling uh, transition, especially at the secondary level, and there could be additional capacity for us to expand in-person experiences at the elementary level. But it sounds like it's better to get in and stay in the that. That's the expectation. Uh, but we will, we will, similar to today, as we... Uh, track towards term three will provide more information to families about what will be available for in-person experiences. Yes, Perry. So the mayor and other city officials have said, based on our metrics, it is safe to return in some capacity to in-person learning. So based on that, why is there no in-person options for middle and high schoolers? And how much of this, this plan, is based on how much unionized staff you have or you think you can get to come back? So, you know, who we are targeting for term two uh, is driven by what we've learned and what we know about uh, what what's happening with learning at home right now uh, and also to mitigate disruption of scheduling and the academic experience for students. And so we, we do know, uh, we have strong indication from families and staff uh, that our youngest learners are um, a lot less independent and learning at home is a bit more challenging for them as it relates to uh, the, the volume of screen time, uh, interaction uh, with their teacher virtually, uh, and so we know that there's there's a challenge there specifically for our youngest learners. For our secondary students, uh, as I mentioned earlier, their classroom assignments are based uh, primarily on semester assignments. And so a transition of a teacher uh, and a secondary student typically has multiple teachers uh, instead of one grade level teacher. We believe that the number of transitions required to uh, create an in-person experience for secondary students at a large scale uh, would be more disruptive and not productive. Uh, that's the reason why we're targeting uh, 6 through 12 for term three. Uh, however, uh, there are secondary students that are, are, are being served in our student support centers, and we could see expansion of that. And one area of interest is career and technical education uh, to provide our secondary students the ability to complete their uh, required credentials for uh, in-person experiences on the various career pathways that they're pursuing. And could you explore, for instance, special education students who are in contained classrooms? Yeah, that that is a consideration. Uh, and again, we prioritize uh, our earliest learners, just given um, whether it's um, you know a student receiving special education services or an English language learner. We've seen the greatest challenge with learning at home with our youngest learners, and that's why we prioritize them. And will the, the classrooms, the ESL and special education contained elementary school classrooms? Will those be taught by licensed ESL teachers and licensed special education teachers? Yes, the expectation is of the licensure needed to support uh, those specific student groups or provided related services will not change. Yes. 
Uh, the, the teachers union uh, president had said that she had asked DCPS to sign a memorandum of agreement uh, before returning mostly, you know, and also a checklist for safety guidelines and working conditions. You had talked about how there will be a tour available uh, in coming days or weeks, I'll put it that way. My question is, um, the teachers union president is saying that there has not been any kind of agreement on this, though, made between the union and DCPS before today's announcement. Can you talk about why? Stephanie, I'm going to repeat your question for our interpreters. I mean, in, in a nutshell, you correct me if I don't get it right. Um, the question was that the teachers union president has asked the status of a agreement, a memorandum of understanding, and you want to know why? Of, of working conditions and safety protocols. That, that includes a checklist of working conditions and safety protocols. And why that has not been agreed upon before today's announcement. And why it has not been agreed upon for today's announcement. So um, President Davis has said on many occasions, as I have, that um, there is a need to provide in-person experiences for our students. And President Davis has also indicated that um, there's a desire for teachers to do so. And we'll continue to collaborate with the Washington Teaching Union and our other partners on uh, how we accomplish that. Uh, today, we wanted our families to know uh, what our expectations are, uh, the planning uh, that has been uh, in place and will continue to play, take place for uh, in-person activities. And we'll continue conversations with all of our union partners around uh, what will um, be required of them and what will be required of us as we track towards the November 9th uh, in-person experiences. Two, question, two more questions for you on that. Um, we're getting reports that there are some issues with the program that you had asked teachers to respond to on Friday and today. Do you plan on extending that deadline on whether they want to return to in-person? Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie, for asking that question. So she asked, um, there there were some um, technical glitches, um, she said, that was associated with the staffing assignment survey. Uh, and we did notice some slowdowns at period of time when there was a large volume of uh, individuals logging in. Uh, as a result, we will extend the uh, deadline by day. Uh, and um, staff will have until uh, 5 o'clock on uh, Tuesday, October 6th, to complete that staffing assignment survey. Yes, Mark. So uh, you know the, the union's position on this survey. Can you tell us how many, what percentage of teachers have, have filled out the survey? And of those, what percentage have said they're willing to come back into the classroom? Yeah, it's, it's premature, Mark, at this point, I believe, to, to, to estimate. We're still receiving uh, results from the survey as we speak. But I want to be really clear, Mark, that the, the staffing assignment survey that we've asked individuals to complete is asking staff to share with us, um, you know, their their situation and situation that may impact their ability to work in person. It is not related to uh, our health and safety protocols or commitments that we referenced today. And it's important for us to have that information so we can support our employees with any needed documentation uh, associated with the provisions for special assignments for uh, virtual roles. So do you have numbers that indicate to you right now that you will have enough teachers on November 9th for the in-person learning and that you have set up? Again, uh, it's premature, Mark, at this point to, to speculate um, what, what the staffing uh, assignments will be based on the survey, but we want all of our staff members to share that information with us so we can plan accordingly. And then if a staff member does not complete the survey, the assumption is that they are available and ready to work in person. And so what happens if you don't have enough teachers? What, what happens if the union protests? And I got to say, I think President Davis would take exception to your saying that you've been collaborating with them. There may have been discussions, but by her account, there's been very little collaboration between the teachers union and DCPS, and they're just learning about all of this right now through this press conference. And so what if November 9th comes and the, w and, and the teachers union tells its membership, yeah, we don't think it's safe to go back inside and you don't have enough teachers? Well, 
I don't want to play too much what if. And, and what I will tell you is this, is that we're committed to being responsive to the needs of our students. And we will do it with great safety. And we will provide the resources to make that happen. Uh, in terms of, um, you know, you, you, you're referencing, you know, what President Davis might say. Uh, I, I know that we were able to reach an agreement for how we would operate in term one. Uh, and we had a very rich conversation on last week about what that would look like for term two. And we both agreed that we needed to double down uh, and spend more time having more discussions. And we've added more time this week. Uh, to have more discussions. And so those discussions are very active, very active, uh, and will continue, and we're committed to having those conversations as long as we need to uh, to ensure that, you know, everyone understands where we are and the direction that we're headed. Have you talked to her about these non-teachers who will be in the CARES classrooms, and will those non-teachers, wherever they are, will they be union members? It sounds like the union might have some problems with that if those it sounds like those people non-teachers monitoring these classrooms would be taking the role of teachers well the, the roles are not the same uh, we again we've outlined the roles for uh, the in-person learning classroom and the expectation is uh, that those classrooms are being taught uh, by our dcps teachers yes perry money will it cost you to hire um, additional teachers to staff if you can't get them from school system employees? Will you have to? I saw you said community partners, but I don't know if that meant you're paying them. Um, yeah, how much is it going to cost you guys? Yeah, so we don't know what that universe will be because um, we're still uh, in the process of understanding what the demand will be. And so that will be driven by you know, what families uh, indicate to us as we reach out and, and offer seats. Uh, and we have a large contingency of uh, DCPS employees across uh, various work groups and, and also across government agencies that uh, we're confident uh, will support us in our efforts to provide in-person experiences to our students. Is there any money in the budget to hire additional staff for these classes? I think that the okay. chance has answered your question, Perry. Um, we will we will provide the resources necessary based on what our students and families need. Yes, yes. And we're going to um, wrap up shortly. Yes. I'd like to ask then, can we please turn to the president? The situation with COVID nineteen spread at the White House, and are you concerned right now that what is happening on White House grounds is now spilling into? local D.C. residents, impacting local D.C. residents, and has the White House contacted uh, D.C. Health or D.C. officials at all to confirm these are D.C. residents involved in the COVID-19 spread? So let me uh, just say, and Dr. Nesbitt will, will have more to say about this, and obviously we're concerned about the spread of COVID-19, period. We're um, especially concerned with people following um, scientifically justified protocols uh, to contain the spread of the virus. And um, that's for D.C. residents, that's for D.C. workers, and that's for also people who are on um, federal properties, including the White House. Um, so we have a mask mandate uh, in our city for a reason. Uh, we limit large gatherings to 50 or fewer uh, for a reason. We ask people to socially distance for a reason. We remind people to stay home if they are sick for a reason. Uh, and that applies uh, to everybody. Uh, and so we want to continue to remind uh, people of that. Uh, there are established uh, public health protocols uh, at the White House that are federal in nature, and I'll ask Dr. Nesbitt uh, to talk about uh, that. We assume um, that those protocols have been engaged. Uh, we have reached out to the White House uh, on a couple of levels, a political level and a public health level, uh, to make sure that uh, any assistance that we could provide could be rendered. Uh, we, uh, and I think I'll leave this 
piece of advice to Dr. Nesbitt to, to go on more thoroughly, uh, but we uh, would assume, because we don't know with our close contacts happened um, and at these various events that people uh, who were exposed at those events get tested uh, and quarantine themselves uh, while uh, they await uh, their results. Uh, we would further remind people uh, that our D.C. sites are available to them. If you live or work in D.C. or you've visited D.C., um, you can use uh, our uh, sites for testing. But we remind you, if you go to a site, that's because you think you've been exposed and you should quarantine yourself um, during uh, that process. Uh, we would also remind uh, all of the health professionals, and this is how we know uh, if we have D.C. cases, because a person goes to their doctor or goes to one of their sites, and positive cases are reported, are required to be reported uh, to D.C. Health, and D.C. Health um, then, through the contact trace force, um, completes contact tracing uh, interviews. Yes. Residents that were at that event who have clearly said that they aren't going to follow DC's health guidelines. There were members of Congress who were appearing for House floor votes who had close contact. Bill Barr has said he's not going to quarantine, intends to show up for work. What are you going to do to enforce the uh, public health guidelines and make sure that those people are following them? I'm not sure what you're what you mean by that. Bar, for example, you know, multiple po positive COVID cases around him. He is being tested. He is, as so far, tested negative, but that could very easily change. He has said that he is not going to quarantine for 14 days. He intends to show up for work. That seems to be in violation of the public health code that DC has put forward about when people should quarantine. So what are you going to do about that? Are you going to ensure that he quarantines? Is there anything you can do to make sure that he's not showing up for work when he's a very potentially a high COVID risk? Um, the, the White House uh, enforces its policies, and that's what we would expect to happen. But he's a D.C. resident, so why does he not I don't know him? what resident he is. Do you? I believe he is a D.C. resident. Okay. If he, if he is a D.C. resident, there are, are other D.C. residences. Why is the White House responsible for them? Why are they not being addressed as D.C. residents? If they are D.C. residents, they are being addressed as D.C. residents. Uh, and if they test it in the way um, that I just mentioned, and that they are, if they are a positive case, and it, was, uh, it should be sent to the Department of Health, and then they will be treated the way any positive case is treated. But if they are a negative case and a close contact, they're still technically supposed to quarantine for 14 days out of an abundance of caution, correct? Dr. Nesbitt. Yes. So... Um, it's important for people to recognize that the public health authority that extends to our jurisdiction is one of a legal matter. And while there is lots of uh, discussion that is happening in the public domain, our authority is one of, again, a legal matter. In order for us to legally enforce a quarantine, we must have confirmation of, what a, clo of a close contact by the individual who cites them as a close contact and confirmation of that individual's positive test. As the mayor has outlined, if individuals are tested in the District of Columbia, their test is required to be reported to us by regulation by those healthcare providers. By speaking to no one specific circumstance, if that information has been provided to us, the DC Health Department through our disease investigation process, affectionately known as the DC Contact Trace Force, uh, will do its work. If individuals have been cited to us as a close contact, we have the ability to enforce a quarantine in that situation, regardless of an individual who is a close contact has been defined already today as being within six feet for at least 15 minutes, or having come into close contact with the respiratory secretions or the infected secretions of an individual. We are not allowed to take legal action by someone's perception of an individual being a close contact. So I cannot take someone to court and enforce a quarantine for someone because of public speculation. So I think that's important for people to remember in this situation. So yes, we have authority to do things. We have lots of authority to do things and we are engaged in doing things without talking about anyone's personal or specific circumstances. But I think it's important for people to remember that what the perceptions around a, an ability to enforce a quarantine are 
versus our legal recourse and ability to do so. I hope that clarifies the matter. Can I follow up on that, Doctor? So, without identifying anybody, has the D.C. Department of Health been notified by the White House or anyone else of any positive tests? I think I've answered the question the way I'm going to answer it, Mark. I'm sorry? I've answered the question the way I'm going to answer it. So you won't tell us if you've been notified? I've answered the question the way I'm going to answer it. Uh, what, if, if there were an event in the District of Columbia, I mean, let's say like the Rose Garden event, that you could trace back eight to ten positive cases from one event. How would you characterize that? Is that average for DC? Have you seen that kind of numbers come out of one event that you can trace back to? Or would that, how, how would you characterize that? I don't know what you mean by average for DC. We have what I what I would what I would encourage you to think of what I would encourage you to say. And the mayor has given an excellent. Um, I don't know how we oh, stated any more eloquently than the mayor has already discussed. Um, in the District of Columbia, based on the science and what we know about COVID-19, we have encouraged people not to attend events that are larger than 50 people. We have encouraged people to wear face masks. We have a mask mandate. We have encouraged people to be socially distant. We have also encouraged people to choose the activities that they would go to wisely, such that if someone was hosting an event where people were not going to wear face masks, where people would not be socially distant, that you would choose to make better decisions about attending such an event. We have also encouraged people that if they were not in their usual state of health, that they would not attend any group activities, that they would not go outside of their home, um, and that they would stay home once they had been tested awaiting those results. And if you were the close contact of someone, if you had not yet been tested because it was not in that three to five day window, that you would remain home. And most importantly, we have always emphasized that you cannot test your way out of quarantine. So th that's my position on the things that are going on right now that are such uh, hot topics. And those are our, our, that are our advice to district residents um, who have concern about what their level of potential exposure are at this time. Given what you know about the Rose Garden event, would you consider that a super spreader event? I, 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 we don't have a publicly, public health defined uh, term for super spreader. Like, there's no quantifiable way for people talking about super spreader. So I, I, I cannot sanction that. Yes, Stephanie. Um, to, to your recollect, recollection, um, when was the last time you would say that many people tested positive related to one event in the district? It, is there another question that, that could be asked? I don't have any comments for for, 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 for that. I don't think that we have uh, anything more to say about the numbers, if we've seen another one like that. Yes. Hey, Bowser, you said uh, just earlier that you had reached out to the White House on a political level, on a public health level, to offer whatever assistance you can. Mm -hmm. Did you receive a response, and how would you characterize that response? We haven't um, received a response. I haven't received a response. And let me just say that I recognize, you know, being as generous um, in this situation as I can be, that a lot was going on and they have their hands full with a, with a lot on kind of that level. Um, but I think that one of Dr. Nesbitt's team had a very – um, cursory conversation um, that we don't consider a substantial contact with on the from the public health side so we'll continue um, we'll continue that communication those those attempts yes has contact tracing begun for those DC residents that uh, tested positive and were linked to uh, White House events and if so, have they been compliant in helping you with contact tracing and providing close contacts? Let me just kind of emphasize kind of the, the trail of e events. Um, DC Health uh, is, won't be um, talking about specific White House cases. So let me kind of just start there. And so anyone who is tested, either one of our, our test sites or from their own doctor, 
and they live in the district, what our law requires is that those health care providers to send that information to D.C. Health. Um, and D.C. Health will follow its protocol um, for, um, for contact tracing. And their goals for contact tracing are what? Within, within, complete an interview within three days. Yes. I have a question about constituent service funds. Can you um, discuss why your office has not used any constituent service funds during this pandemic? Um, I, I really can't, no. Is there any reason? I know that there are businesses and other things and constituents looking for grants, and I understand you have a few hundred thousand dollars in there. Say again. Um, I understand. I know that there are businesses and nonprofits looking for grants or looking for city money. So, is there a reason or is there a strategy behind that? Are you that? suggesting that constituent services are city monies? No, I'm just asking what the strategy is in using it this year. Honestly, Perry, my uh, full attention is on um, the response to the pandemic, contact testing and tracing, getting kids back to school. Um, and uh, our staff who typically yield questions like that are also focused on uh, emergency um, responses. There's no reason, um, and we are dealing with those emergency responses through our regular budgeting process and the COVID emergency budgeting process. Thank you. Yeah. Can I follow up on immunizations back to schools? Just Yes. Because I just I know you said everyone's going to have to have their immunization by day one. That's always pretty much been the policy in DCPS, but as a largely ignored policy that there's been a lot of wiggle room given That's to parents. Not. Well, as a DC That's parent not. of two kids, I can tell you that my experience has been that that I've never had my kids told they can't come to school on the first day because they didn't have their immunization. So I'm just wondering, will there actually be a zero tolerance policy for it this year? Because, you know, it, it's harder than ever to get to a doctor and get those shots now. So i got to imagine that it's going to be problematic for some parents and students. And if you're telling them that there's going to be a zero tolerance to this, I just think they should know that. Typically, uh, a student and, and family is given 20 days to provide certification of immunization for that particular age group of the child. Uh, in this case, obviously, we passed the 20th day of school. Uh, so the expectation is if a student is engaged in a uh, in-person learning experience uh, when we're entering term two, uh, they would have a uh, complete certification to provide. We are uh, continuing to offer immunization services and uh, our school-based health centers, and that's open to uh, all of our youth, whether they are a DCPS student or not. Do you know the percentage of students who you currently have the immunization certification for? Yeah, so I don't, I don't have current immunizations to report. However, uh, to, to answer your question about zero tolerance, yes, the expectation is that every student have an immunization certificate before they uh, participate in in-person learning. Did your staff tell us today that number of how many you've gotten so far, that, that what percentage of students so far have complied with that? And so again, we I don't have numbers today that I can share with you on current immunizations. Um, but again, if a student is going to participate in in-person learning term two, the expectation is they've completed that process. <laughs>